Hi, I'm Angela Kavner, the Executive Director of CAI. I would like to welcome all attendees and thank the Board of Directors and the CAI team for today's program. Uh, we have an announcement for uh, next Wednesday, September 2nd, will be our next session of the Wednesday webinar. A few housekeeping rules. All participants today will be muted. If you have questions, please type them in the question box and be sure to state the panels that you would like the question directed to. If you need a certificate for manager credits, please email Jackie at Jacqueline, J-A-C-L-Y-N, at C-A-I-N-J dot org. Just a note, you must be in attendance for the entire presentation to qualify for a certificate. Our first presenter today will be Cheryl Siegel. Cheryl is a litigator and partner at the firm Buckaloo, Frizzell & Cravina. She concentrates her practice on complete uh, complex commercial litigation and construction defect lit litigation, as well as contesting code violations and bringing emergent applications in court. She also handles arbitration and mediations of contract disputes, and she helps clients navigate insurance issues that arise after large casualty losses. Today, Cheryl will be discussing assessments and procedures. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you so much, Angela, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, my name is Cheryl Siegel. I'm a partner with the law firm Buckaloo, Frizzell & Cravina with offices in Glen Rock and in Asbury Park. And today we're going to talk about an important topic that impacts every association of every size, and that is the collection of maintenance fees. It's really a given. I certainly don't need to expand upon the fact that every association has to stay on top of its collections because it's only through collecting the maintenance fees or assessments that the association is able to function and pay its bills. If owners don't pay their fair share, then the association is left short on its budgetary needs to provide all of the essential services that the association provides. So in a few minutes, I will review the nuts and bolts of the legal process that's used to collect outstanding maintenance fees. But first, I want to just give you a few tips, which based on my experience, will make the process easier and will hopefully, hopefully give you the advantage of more effectively collecting on delinquent accounts. So my first tip, and I can't stress this enough, is start early. Don't wait until a unit owner hasn't paid for six months before turning it over to an attorney for collection. The expression, good things come to those who wait, does not necessarily apply here, okay? And there are lots of reasons for this. As a general rule of thumb, it's much easier and much more effective to work on paying down a smaller debt than it is a larger one. So if a unit owner is three months behind, that's a lot easier to deal with than when it gets to the point of 12 months. Um, you don't wanna let it get to that point because it's a lot easier to catch up on a $1,200 balance than a $12,000 balance. Um, certainly a manager or a board may wanna try to deal with the situation on their own before turning it over to an attorney. And that's certainly understandable. There are good reasons for that. But after one or two months, if you're not seeing results, you should promptly hand it over to your attorney. Another reason not to wait is that other unit owners in the community who may have been slow up until now in making their payments will now start making them more timely when, the, when they know that the board is actively pursuing collections of their accounts. So when our law firm is retained by an association and they have some accounts that have been sitting for quite some time, I like to sit down and explain to them that going forward, they and we should be more proactive with the collections and eventually there will be less of a problem as word gets out that the board is no longer being lack, uh, laid back about its collections and there'll be fewer collection issues over time. Lastly, the longer you wait, the greater the chances are that something is gonna happen that makes the process more difficult. The unit owner may abandon the unit, may move away, may move out of state, uh, may file for bankruptcy, or may be now uh, in, in uh, bind with its mortgage for and there's a foreclosure. Now the association is going to be in a much more difficult position to collect the fees that are owed. Not impossible, but more difficult. So the first tip and the first takeaway from today is start the process early. 
Second tip, make sure the account ledger is updated frequently and timely. If your governing documents permit late fees, then they should be posted each month at whatever interval, whatever date the association has set as the deadline that if you don't pay by then, then late fees are going to be assessed. The same thing goes for attorney's fees. As soon as the association receives an invoice for attorney's fees, that amount should be posted to the account history. If you try to post them all at once, midway through the process, then you could run into a scenario where a unit owner thinks, based on his last statement, okay, I owe $2,000, here's a check for $2,000, I'm good. And then you come back and say, oh no, wait a minute, there's additional late fees and attorney's fees. You don't want to be in that position. You want the statements and you want the ledgers to be as updated and as accurate as possible. The third tip is be practical about payment plans. Like anything else, you have to handle these matters with a healthy dosage of common sense. If a unit owner has historically paid his maintenance fees on time, but for whatever reason fell behind and now asks for a payment plan, if the plan he proposes is reasonable, then you can accept that payment plan, but be smart about it. Ask for an initial lump sum payment up front to show some good faith, and then the rest over a reasonable period of time. It should be a relatively short period of time, no more than six months. If absolutely necessary, you can extend it to 12. Put the payment plan in writing and have it signed by the unit owner so that He's agreed not only by virtue of being an owner and it's implied and it's expressed in the master deed and bylaws that he has to pay his maintenance fees, but now you have another piece of paper. You have a written agreement that's signed by him specifically that says he understands his obligations and he's going to comply with them. So um, be smart. Takeaway number three is be reasonable, be practical, put a payment plan in writing, and get a countersigned by the owner. Okay, so what are the steps that should be taken? It's really hard to do it justice in you know seven or eight or nine minutes, uh, but I'm gonna give you a basic overview. Of course, as a lawyer, I have to give you a disclaimer. This is not to be taken as specific legal advice, but just a basic overview of the process. If you have any specific questions and we don't get to them today on the chat, about your association, you can call me and I'd be happy to speak with you offline. Number one, read the governing documents. Know what remedies you have available to you in your master deed and bylaws if a unit owner defaults. Can you impose late fees? Can you impose interest? Um, some associations that have been around for a while and have an older set of governing documents that haven't been updated, Sometimes you find out that they don't actually call for late fees, even though late fees have been charged for a long, long period of time. It may be necessary for you to amend your bylaws, um, but know what you're up against, because if you don't have that provision in your bylaws um, and a unit owner challenges that in court, you will not be able to collect them. Um, what are the provisions that call for payment back by the unit owner of attorney's fees? You wanna know that provision. Do your governing documents allow you to accelerate for the rest of the fiscal year? Most of them do, some older ones don't. What are the notice requirements? So again, know what your documents permit and what they require. Second step, send a collection letter. That's usually first done by the manager. Um, and then after that, then the attorney will send a collection letter. And a word of caution, again, it's way too broad a topic to cram into this short period of time, but it's very important to remember that under the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, the FDCPA, a creditor must provide 30 days notice before being able to file a lawsuit, has to give certain disclosures, disclaimers, you have to give debt verification to substantiate the debt if you're asked to do so. So you have to be very careful about your delinquency letters make sure that the standard form that you're going to use is approved by the association's attorney. Another good reason to send the letter also is that it gives the debtor the opportunity to cure the arrears while the balance is still relatively low. It's always easier to do these things pre-litigation if you can. Let the unit owner know the balance, plus again, update the, the account 
history include any um, attorney's fees or other expenses that are going to be incurred as a result of writing this letter so that if the unit owner does pay what's owed, he also includes the attorney's fees in the amount. Next, if your governing documents permitted, accelerate to the end of the association's fiscal year. Send another letter. The attorney should send another letter notifying the unit owner that now we're going to accelerate your account. Follow the notice requirements set forth in the governing documents. Now you've given him another opportunity to pay. Um, next step, if after all of these efforts, still not getting traction, then you do a present owner and lender search to know exactly who is or who are the right owners, the lawful legal owners of record of the unit, what mortgages are outstanding, do a bankruptcy search, make sure that the unit owners haven't already filed for bankruptcy. If you do these preliminary steps now at this early stage, it'll save you a lot of hassle later on. Um, once you get that uh, piece of inf those pieces of information and you've waited the requisite period of time, now you're at the point where you can record a lien claim in the county clerk's office and file a lawsuit in the Superior Court of New Jersey. I wanna just give a very quick detour for a minute to review the practical differences between filing a lien claim against the unit and filing a lawsuit seeking a monetary judgment. They're both very important tools. They can be done simultaneously. You don't have to choose one, of the, one over the other, but they both serve a different function. A lien claim is a simple, inexpensive way, okay? Our law firm actually charges a flat fee um, plus the county recording charges. And um, because of the notices that you have to give both to the unit owner and to the lender, you're making the unit owner and the lender aware uh, that a lien has been recorded or is about to be recorded. Sometimes it'll actually trigger a six month payment by the lender because um, under the New Jersey Condominium Act, that's the maximum uh, limited priority is the six months worth of maintenance fees. But even if not, you're again, you're, you're telegraphing a message to the unit owner that you're taking the account seriously and you are taking active steps to collect it. The limitation or the limits of a lien claim is that it doesn't put money directly into the association's pocket. It's gonna sit in the clerk's office so that if the unit owner goes to sell his unit or refinance, um, it has to be satisfied either prior to or at the time of closing, but it doesn't get you paid at least right, not right away. That's where the lawsuit comes into play. It takes more time. It is more costly, <clears throat> but you follow the process step by step, obtain a monetary judgment, and then you can pursue collection efforts, which I'll get to in a minute, to get that judgment paid. Remember that most governing documents call for the unit owner to be responsible to pay for those attorney's fees that the association incurred because of the unit owner's non-payment. So make sure to include that in the amount of the judgment. Okay, back to the steps. After the lawsuit is filed, you have, you have to make sure it's served properly on the unit owner. The owner will have 35 days to file an answer. What happens next really depends largely on the unit owners. If they don't file an answer, then after 35 days, you can file for a default against them, depending on what court you're in, whether it's law division or special civil part. Um, either it will be entered automatically or you have to file a request for the default. If the owner does file an answer, then you will likely have to make a motion for summary judgment where you follow the, the rules, the court rules, you explain that the material facts are undisputed, there's no dispute that he hasn't uh, paid his maintenance fees and that the master deed and bylaws by law, the law says that you're entitled to a judgment as a matter of law, so there's no justification for them not paying it and you request um, a, a judgment against the unit owner. In some cases, if it's not granted, then you have to prepare a tri for trial and uh, try the case and uh, get your judgment that way. Once you have the judgment, two minutes I'm being told, that's fine, that's perfect. Once you have the judgment, you, can, you should docket it in Trenton. That's an important step because by docketing it in Trenton, then you can enforce that judgment against any asset that the unit owner owns 
either in the county or elsewhere in the county or elsewhere in New Jersey, in any county in New Jersey. Um, and that's then you follow the process with bank levies, uh, wage executions. Um, there are other more complicated ways that I can talk about, uh, but sometimes you have to be creative. So to wrap up, I want to emphasize, stay on top of the process, be proactive. You may even want to have a board resolution adopting a uniform collection protocol so that the process is very straightforward and very streamlined. Most importantly, stay in close contact with your attorneys to achieve the best results in collecting these maintenance fees, um, finding the assets that are owned by the unit owners and safeguarding your association's financial health. Thank, Thank you, sir. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Um, the first one, how should associations handle requests by unit owners who are going through financial hardship as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, so very um, timely question, very, uh, very common right now. Um, and it's a, it's a delicate balance. The board wants to and should be understanding of the unique challenges that COVID-19 has imposed on all of us. Um, on the other hand, the association as an entity has its own unique challenges and may face its own additional expenses uh, because of COVID. So while the board may wanna be sensitive to the needs of individual unit owners, it still has a fiduciary duty to all of the unit owners uh, to maintain the common areas and pay its vendors. So I would follow the same rules of thumb that I mentioned earlier. Number one, stay on top of the situation early on before it becomes unmanageable. If a unit owner asks for assistance, ask him to put the proposal in writing. You may have some kind of a standardized form of application, and you may wanna ask for certain documentation to make it legit, make sure it's legitimate, that there's a legitimate need if uh, someone's on uh, unemployment or has been furloughed from their employment, you may wanna see some documentation to support that. You wanna be even-handed and consistent, fit, same treatment of all unit owners, no matter what race, gender, religion, or any other protected class, and then using the third tip that I gave you earlier, be practical about coming up with a payment plan that's reasonable. If it can be achieved, if they're just looking for a 30 or 60 day breather, and then they'll be able to continue, that's one option. And you don't impose late fees as long as they pay back by the agreed upon date. Um, otherwise you may need a short, again, short period of time, no more than four to six months um, to allow the owner to, uh, to catch up make it clear, uh, this is something I would do, I would make it clear that you're gonna record a lien claim anyway, just to safeguard the association as best as possible, um, and you'll release it as soon as everything is paid up, and put everything into a written agreement so that if the unit owner unfortunately can't continue or can't keep up with the payment plan, that you've protected your, your association as best you can. Okay, and that's there's one. That's great. And there's one more question. Uh, does the unit owner who is in arrears have the right to vote in the election for the board of directors? Okay, so under the Prevda amendments, commonly known now as the Radburn law, as well as recent regulations adopted by the DCA just within the past few months, the ability to restrict a unit owner from voting in an election from the board of trustees um, for not being in good standing has become much more defined and much more regulated. So if a unit owner is on a payment plan and they're current, they're making their payments um, as they're supposed to, then even though they technically have a balance, they are considered in good standing. If they have disputed their debt, if they, if there is a pending litigation and they're dis or, or even if they've asked for debt verification, um, if there's a dispute, and it's not clear to them anyway that, that the payments are owed, they are not considered, they are still considered in good standing and they cannot be excluded from voting. Now that said, under the new regulations, the association has to give 30 days notice to a unit owner that 
you're not in good standing and you're not going to be eligible to vote in the upcoming election unless you cure your arrears within five days and you have to offer them alternate dispute resolution as well. So before, I guess I would say this, before excluding any unit owner's vote, be sure to check with your attorney and plan ahead before, long before the annual election to make sure you're giving the required notices to the right people who are still considered to be in good standing under the new laws. That's great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Uh, those are all the questions. If anyone else has questions, though, for Cheryl, please feel free to type them into the question box, and we will come back to come back at the end. Uh, next up, we have Luciano Olivier, Oliviero from um, Pardini Construction. He has been with he has more than 15 years of experience as an exterior renovation, such as roofing, siding, decks, and masonry work. Today, he will be speak, talking about Sophic and Fascia. Uh, he is off camera, however, I believe he's going to share his PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, whenever you're ready. Hello, hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, my yes, good. So my name is Luciano Oliveira. I'm from Pardini Construction. And uh, today I'd like to speak about fascia and stuff, uh, the specs, the importance, uh, the benefits, and uh, the, ro the role they play as a building structure uh, structure so um, let's start with the fascia which is uh, the fascia boards uh, if you don't know exactly what it is um, just a simple uh, a presentation or clarification uh, the fascia board uh, I don't know if you can see the picture on the third slide is the this white board uh, that's behind the gutter it, it's the mountain uh, where the roof meets the outer walls on the house and it's often called the roof line however uh, most people just call by fascias or fascia boards and uh, um, and the, the purpose of the the fascia boards on the house it's primarily to protect you know the the building structure to get some water some moisture infiltration and to protect the the integrity of the the building structure also give us an aesthetic role, plays an aesthetic role uh, because it creates a beautiful appearance along the roof edge and uh, and protected the you know some parts of the roof and some parts of the building where it's uh, uh, vulnerable to water uh, infiltration. If you uh, check uh, what is the most uh, uh, material uses for the fascia boards uh we can see as a wood fascia which is uh the common choice do is the it's more affordable you can uh, uh it's less money to 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 purchase and to apply and use and uh the usual material use it's a spruce pine or fir and it's water resistant it's not water resistant it's a wood it's subject to rot and need a maintenance it's something that needs to be uh, painting and um, and they stain regularly because if you if you don't protect if you don't do the the necessary maintenance it can get rot and when you neglect the maintenance you have damage uh, as you see in the picture uh, um, the fascia board the one the the, the maintenance is neglect you can see how it can get bad it's not only the fascia board can get damaged, but the roof structure, uh, the rafters, the building structure can also damage. And as well, if they have the the gutter attached to it, it can get damaged as well. Falling, um, and uh, once it's damaged and can, can create a lot of other problems, a lot of issues, and making uh, the repair a lot costly to, to the homeowner or the association. So, when you choose about wood, sometimes some people some people prefer the wood finish or the characters of the wood, but we need to be uh, uh, to have in mind that wood needs maintenance, and uh, if you don't take care, you have you're gonna have an issue and they're gonna shorten the life of the wood on the, the building structure as well. So um, 
What is the other options uh, besides wood? That's aluminophage. It's like waterproofing the, the, the wood structure. It's, uh, it's bendable, you can cover up the wood fascia and give a beautiful uh, uh, aspect. So it's very common and uh, it's totally uh, bendable so we can wrap around the wood and the will definitely extend the, uh, the wood fascia. The installation depends on how the, the, the aspect of the building, uh, and, but uh, usually it's very common when you go to, uh, most of the buildings today use a lot of aluminum to wrap up uh, and protect the wood instead of just you know, use painting. It's very common. It can be, depends on the type of aluminum you choose, can be a little bit expensive, but it's a very worth uh, option for a wood fascia. Another option, it's the vinyl, uh, which it supply, instead of use the wood fascia, you can use, uh, you can install direct to the roof the rafters. It's called PVC, that's a lot of brands. One of the most common, it's AZAC, but um, it's a PVC defined in a polyvinyl chloride called, it stands for PVC. Uh, use uh, plot sizes for giving some flexibility. It's, it's very common, it's used a lot today in the in, uh, in industry. And um, like I say, it's fast and direct to the wood fashion that give a beautiful appeal. It's very uh, weather resistant, uh, the different you know, type of you know, the hot and the cold, uh, the variance of the weather. And they, it's very common as well, uh, besides the aluminum, that's another, option and the third option it's the UPA, upvs it's like the pvc but uh, has less flex sizers uh, uh plastic on the, his composition it's more rigid but it, but it also ha it's more durable it's not had the life span it's bigger and uh, he required just a little meanness but uh, the aesthetic uh, a few, it's, it's, it's very beautiful. It's more you know, water, it's more weather resistant and chemical resistant and give a smooth surface. So better, uh, permits a better water flow. So this four, this is the most four uh, type of material uses for the, the fascia boards. And uh, overall, the, the roof, uh, overall and the roof assistant, the fascia serve for four things. It's used to secure the goddess uh, to the roof and keep them in place. So give support to the to, to the goddess. Also blocks the water from penetrating the roof deck and uh, to attic home space. And also increases the curb appeal by covering the open uh, rough ends of the rafters. And also finally, uh, close off any unwanted access to insects, birds, squirrels, any type of uh, animals. Nobody wants those things accessing the attic or make uh, the attic space as uh, their home, uh, their nest. So the, it, it's a very, it's a very important, uh, uh, it's a very important uh, part of the house and it play as a very important role to protect and to maintain uh, uh, the house integrity, the building structure integrity, and also to prevent other things, other elements from the nature to get inside our buildings. And um, now let's talk about soffit. Soffit, it's um, another, it's connected to, to the, the fascia boards. They work it together. And um, what it is soffit? Soft, it's the material between the roof eaves where the fascia and goddess are placed to the wall. It's the underside of the eaves or the roof overhang, which can be enclosed or exposed. Uh, if you don't know what it is, if you, you're not sure if your house has or not uh, the soffits, you just have to go outside if you, you see, look up and see if your roof have any overhangs. So if you don't have the overhangs, you don't have the soft. But once you look it up and you see the roof extend the walls, you have an overhang, then you have a soft. If you look at the picture I just put over here, uh, you can see the examples of many locations where the soffit is installed in the building. Also, what is the purpose of the soffit? So like many parts of the home exterior, soft serves both for aesthetic and functional purpose. Functionality-based mission at soffit is to protect 
the rafters from the elements, keeping the moisture, moisture away from the rafters and to reduce the chance of mold and helps preserve the life of the materials. So what is the material used for the soffits? Like the fascia boards, soffits, and the most materials uh, around the building, uh, wood, aluminum, PVC, and UPVC are the most uh, material used for, to protect the building. And it's not different with the soft itself. So overall, the soft helps uh, keep a steady airflow between the roof and the attic. They can be solid, they can be vented, and they help this, the airflow between the roof and the attic. They keep is also help to keep uh, the attic well ventilated to prevent moisture build up, which can lead to mold to form. Nobody wants mold on his, on his uh, property. Nobody wants mold to grow inside the attic. Also, another aspect, another benefit of the soft that helps release the heat from the attic during the hot summer's month. And also, like the fascia, they keep the animals, insects, uh, from getting inside your home. Uh, bees, wasps, all those things like to uh, nestle in the soffit uh, because it's a hot place. And so if you need it, uh, you need to pay attention to the soft to maintain, to prevent those animals, those insects to invade uh, the attic space. It's important to make sure it's maintenance uh, always because sometimes we have a storm, a storm can move things around uh, on the building it's more it's very important to pay attention on the uh, on the integrity of the soffit integrity of the fascia so you don't get animals inside your building and then once you notice something that's not working properly it's not in a place it's it's important to get a replace and get a fix right away so two minutes i'll look at two more minutes okay so we're speaking uh uh Speaking uh, of uh, airflow uh, in attic space, it's important. If you see the next picture, you can see the location of the soft and how the airflow should uh, uh, flow to the attic space. It's not only to flow freely, but it's important to flow between the rafters and uh, exit by the ridge vents because these things will keep the integrity, uh, the life of the building structure. If, um, if your attic space, it's too hot, it's cooking the elements, so it's cooking and killing the life of the, the roofing, the life of the, the, the building structure, the lumber, the sheet decking, roof uh, decking. So it's important the, uh, the house has a proper ventilation so uh, you keep your attic cool and also you keep expand you expand the life of your roofing you expand the life of the your building structure and uh, and uh, avoid problem like moisture uh, build up if you leave if you see the next uh, 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 picture you can notice that when a, a roof is not proper ventilation it starts to to have excess excessive moisture which leads to mold uh, in the picture uh, uh, that I'm looking right now uh, the 20 slide, you can see uh, a, 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 a sheeting there's uh, uh, creating molding for uh, improper ventilation, also for connection. Uh, when the dry vent or better vent is not properly connected, going out to the roof. So, those things, if you blow inside the attic, you lead for moisture buildup, and we create also uh, 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 mold to grow. So uh, to conclude, fascia and soft plays an important role and force on the integrity of the building structure elements and also an aesthetic curb appeal of the same. So I hope that I could help you guys understand a little bit more what it is and the importance of these both elements. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer for you guys. Are there, thank you, Luciano. There are actually two questions. Uh, first one up, can my existing wood face should be replaced by a low maintenance material and would it be financially worthy? Yes, definitely it can. Uh, if, you, if you have any, if you have a different, like you have a wood face and now you're stuck with that, we can, we, you can improve. And, uh, and um, 
will cost a little bit more to install aluminum or PVC material, but uh, in the in the lifespan of the the building, you're gonna save a lot of money of maintenance. You probably will end up spend a little bit more money uh, on the first when you uh, up front because we're starting a better product, but uh, you have a worry-free, uh, basically low to no maintenance at all using aluminum or PVC or UPVC material. So it's worthy. And if you need, uh, if you wanted to improve, if you wanted to change it, definitely you can do that. Okay, and there's another question. Uh, can insulation be installed on the ceiling of an attic? Yes. Um, to know how, uh, if your soffit's working, uh, ventilating in your attic, the best thing uh, to do is come uh, call a professional. It can be us as a as a contractor or an engineer, uh, and they can come and inspect your attic space to make sure you have proper ventilation, and your your roof is not cooking, your uh, plywood, the roof deck is not delaminating, or the the building structure, the rafters, it's not being damaged. Be, to be overcooking or creating moisture uh, for improper ventilation. So a, a professional inspection can uh, let you know exactly if your soft is working properly and you have the properly means for have a better ventilation on your attic space. Thank you. Uh, that's it on questions. Uh, again, if there are any other questions, uh, we'll come back to them at the end. Uh, next we have Fred Williams. Thank you, Luciano. Fred Williams of Amco Pest Services brings many years of experience in the pest control industry. Fred specializes in wood destroying insects, birds, and account management. He is IPM certified through Purdue University and is certified WDI inspector through New Jersey PMA. Fred is a certified installer of bird control methods through Bird Be Gone Incorporated. Today he will be discussing rodent and bird solutions. Welcome Fred. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right, great. All right, like you said, I'm gonna step out of the screen so you can see the slideshow here. Today, I'm speaking about bird and rodent control. Uh, right now, we're gonna go over rodent control, uh, what's going on in the environment, the costly damage they're creating, the transmittable diseases that they have. Uh, so first, I'm gonna talk about disease. There are uh, 35 diseases that humans can catch from mice. Uh, the most popular ones are Hantavirus, Salmonella, and LCM, which is a form of meningitis. And um, these diseases are picked up basically from the rodent saliva, feces, urine, bites, and dust. As far as dust, what they mean by that droppings a lot of people will erroneously vacuum up droppings and when you do that if you don't have a specialized vac which is called a hepa vac a, a common vacuum will throw the feces dust into the air and you can breathe that and actually get sick the costly damage from rodents is uh, physical damage to a building it could be electrical damage um, it could be damage to automobiles. Right now, we are dealing with a situation on the Hudson in North Jersey where it's an apartment building and people are complaining that the rodents are actually getting into their cars, chewing the wires, doing damage, and they're picking all the fancy cars too, like the Mercedes and the Lexus. They're not going after the little Toyotas. I don't know why, but so. We're dealing with that. That is primarily caused by what's going on with COVID. Since all the restaurants have been closed, there's a less of a food source for these animals. So they're, they're looking in other places. We're getting calls, not only in apartment areas, but in residential areas where people never really saw rats. The rats are out looking for another food source. So that's becoming a major problem. The rodent damage actually um, on a yearly basis can cause up to $19 billion worth of damage per year. And it can cost people's homes, vehicles, personally thousands of dollars. 
a lot of times also if a, a building is uh, damaged by fire and they can't determine the cause, they'll deem it rodent damage because they'll chew the wires. So we have uh, a very successful rodent control in place that we, uh, we offer to all our customers. And um, if you think you're having an issue, contact us. We can come out and do an inspection for you and then give us your recommendation or give, we'll give you our recommendations on uh, what we would do for you. So that concludes rodent control. Next up is bird control. Primarily in our area where you see problems with uh, pigeons, seagulls, and um, starlings. They're, they're pretty much the, the top three in our area. For these birds, we offer uh, different types of deterrents as far as bird spikes, jolt tracks, and bird netting. Bird spikes are installed on ledges where the birds will land and then they're gonna do their, their thing with their droppings all over the place. So we set these up, they go back up onto the, the ridge where they're hanging out and they, they hit the spikes and they're not able to land like they normally do. So that is uh, an excellent deterrent that we use. That's primarily used in areas where it's not gonna be an aesthetic issue because they, they're a little unsightly. You know, you see the spikes and they stick out. So if it's in a, a back of house area in a warehouse, it's not something you're going to put on the, the middle of somebody's house. For that type of thing, if it's a residential and they're hanging out on the rooftop, they have electric tracks which are installed and it, it doesn't give it doesn't kill the bird when they land on it, but it jolts them off. It's enough to, to bother them. It can be run pretty much anywhere. That's the latest in the high tech for bird control. And they also have a solar panel that hooks to it. So you don't need an electric source. You can run the wires, hook the panel, and then you don't even see this strip if you ran it along the ridge of somebody's roof. Thirdly, another effective method is bird netting which you can use in entry areas. You might have an overhang. As you're walking into the building, a lot of times they'll get up underneath that. You can install it there. It can be used in uh, garden areas, and it can also be used in parking garages. It's a little more involved. Um, it's not something that your maintenance guy would do on his own. There's special tools, special applications to put that up, and then it's gotta be monitored as well. And that covers our rodent and bird control. Thank you. Um, okay, so the first question for you would be, what do you recommend to control bats? Well, to control bats, you inspect typically the person's attic. If they have droppings inside, then you would um, drape netting on the outside of the house at their entryway. Once you get the bats out, of the attic, then you would apply an exclusion material. A lot of times they'll go up underneath the soffit on a house, and then you would put that material underneath so they cannot re-enter. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question. How do I know if I have a rodent infestation? Are there any signs? Yeah, primarily you're gonna notice in food areas, which would be in your kitchen or pantry or garage, if you store any food, even dog food, you'll find droppings. You might find a hole that was gnawed in the, in the drywall from the garage into the house. Um, you might find uh, food items spilled all over. And then also, if you get to the point where it's infestation, you're actually going to see them during the day. Okay. Um, anything to put on utility wires to keep birds away and to decoy owls? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, anything to deter, to, anything that you can use for wires to keep birds away or to decoy owls? Oh, using a wire, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's pretty effective uh, with geese, swans, if, if they're coming up 
off uh, the water onto property. You can run lines and that will deter them because they can't land properly. They need enough room to come down or take off. I've also seen that used on uh, balconies above where anybody's gonna stand. You know, if the birds are coming in off a ledge, you can run a wire across the balcony and that'll deter them also. Okay, and thank you. And the last question for you, would you recommend installing bed houses in the trees of the, in these areas? That's, that's more of a green approach. Um, it, it actually uh, will keep them off of the house itself and it could be used as a mosquito control as well because mosquitoes are their, their number one food source. Okay, thank you. If there are any other questions, please uh, type them into the chat box, to, I'm sorry, into the question box. So thank you, Drew, for waiting so patiently. Uh, finally, we have Drew Cowley. He's the commercial sale and sales inspector for Cowley's Pest Services, a full service pest control company. Today, Drew, Drew will be discussing ant and termite solutions. Welcome, Drew. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Is my screen being shared now? It is. Do you just right. want to enlarge it? Yep. All right. So I press, okay, here we yep. go. That's good. Perfect. Oh, no, I pressed the wrong thing again. Sorry about that. Hold on. Okay. Now it's good. All right. So, hey, everybody. Um, I'm Drew Cowley from Cowley's Pest Services. And today, I will be telling you guys all about ants and termites. So, we'll start with ants. And I'm sure you know what they look like. There's one right in the middle of the screen. So, here are some ant facts. They are a true social insect. Generations overlap. There's divisions of labor. Uh, there is cooperative care of the young. There is a caste system, a precise division of duties among colony members. There's queens, there's reproductives, and there's workers. And they're actually highly advanced. They're one of the most highly evolved social hierarchies among insects. I actually heard a guy giving a presentation on ants one time, and I, I'll never forget it. He described them as the only true communists that get it right, and that always made me laugh but you'll see why as we go on. Uh, ants are believed to have gradually developed from wasps over a hundred million years ago. That's where they kind of look alike. If you look at the body of an ant and the body of a wasp, they have a lot of similarities. Uh, the nodes on the petiolar waist is key to distinguishing features that separate ants from wasps, along with the fact that, you know, there's wings uh, year round on wasps. Um, so beneficial aspects of ants, oops, I was trying to, sorry, Preston, I was trying to get out of my way. Uh, they aid in pollination. So they're aiding in the reproductive of beneficial plants uh, and biological control. They prey on harmful organisms. Uh, they also are involved in recycling, turning over nutrients uh, based of the earth. So of course there's harmful aspects too. Uh, they are invasive to structures. I'm sure you've left uh, something sweet out and the ants have swarmed over it. They can contaminate food. They can short out electricity by getting into outlets. Uh, they can damage wood, specifically carpenter ants, which we'll talk about. They can damage uh, plants. Uh, fire ants are capable of stinging uh, and they can even carry disease agents. Um, so, Northeast Utility Company replaces up to 250 utility poles a year with a cost of $11 million because of carpenter ant damage. So ants can lift approximately 20 times their body weight. They are very strong, right? So if a 175 pound human had the uh, comparative strength, he'd be lifting over 3,500 pounds, which is pretty wild. I don't know about you guys, I don't come close to that and I try. Average life expectancy is 45 to 60 days. So it's a short, sad life for most ants, but some can live up to seven years. Some ants sleep up to seven hours a day and ants have two stomachs, I doubt you knew that. Uh, they have compound eyes and their vision ranges from excellent to blindness, depending on the species. Uh, they use antenna for smell and touch and they leave pheromone trails that can last for minutes or hours. Those pheromone, uh, pheromone trails are how they know to travel in lines that I'm sure you've seen them going in. They're just sniffing out a pheromone and they all know where to go. Uh, so here's how we, uh, that's, 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 
Uh, this is cool. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Hey, can you yell at us? Um, sorry about that there, guys. <laughs> There's work being done. I apologize. Ants are insects, and like all insects, the body has three main parts. The head, the thorax. So here's the head. Here's the thorax, the middle part. And here's the abdomen down low. All right. These are the nodes I was talking about, where the one and two are. Uh, some ants are called tramp species. They'll have multiple queen colonies, multiple colony sites, uh, high reproductive rates through budding. I think they'll be done soon. I apologize about that. Unicolonial behavior, which means they're not aggressive towards colonies of the same species, and uh, they're generally dispersed by humans. So uh, some examples of these are the Argentine ant, the crazy ant, the ghost ant, the odorous house ant, the pharaoh ant, the big-headed ant, and the white-footed ant. Uh, so it's important to identify which type of ant you're dealing with because certain ants you deal with in different ways than other ants. So ways that we do that, like we said, like right here, one node versus two nodes. Uh, the antenna, number of segments, and does it end in a club? If so, how many segments? These are what you gotta rely on professionals like us to figure out so we know how to uh, treat accordingly. Now, this is a big question. What are the differences between ants and termites, all right? Ants have elbowed antenna. Termites have straight bead-like antenna. The connection between the thorax and the abdomen is also different. Ants have a skinny waist. It's narrowly jo uh, jointed, like you saw in the photo. Termites are broadly jointed. They're kind of shaped like a cigar. So I have photos later up that I'll show you there. Uh, their wings are also different. Both ants and termites have wings when they're swarming for part of the year. So ants, the front wings are larger than the rear, and they're held up at an angle during rest. There's a few veins on them too. Termite wings are roughly the same size, and they're held flat over the body at rest, and they have many wings. Uh, so one node ants, uh, just, you know, we talked about that a little bit. We have the one node here two nodes, some of them have two nodes here. Now, their food and their eating habits. So basically, food sources depend on current colony requirements. Proteins are necessary for egg production, higher in the spring. That's when they're gonna be trying to get the proteins. Carbohydrates are needed for energy. So that's what they're gonna start going for late in the summer and in the fall, especially when they're storing up for winter. So right now they're gonna be chasing carbohydrates and fats. Uh, this is not that important right now. So the adult worker diet, they can consume only liquid. Liquid sugars, carbohydrates are shared by the workers. Fats are shared by the workers. Uh, trophallaxis is distribution of food among workers to larvae into the queen. So basically, it's their job to chew it up and then they share it amongst the other ones. So here are the larvae. Maybe you've picked up a rock before and you've seen a bunch of little white, uh, they look like kernels of rice under a rock and all the other ants pick them up and scurry away with them. Those are the larvae. So larvae are fed regurgitated food. That's what we were just talking about. Young larvae are fed liquids by workers. Older larvae can feed on solid food. Oils and protein are fed to larvae by workers, and larvae will regurgitate solids to feed the workers. Now here's the queen. Everybody's heard of the queen ant, right? Bees have them too. Uh, so they, in the spring, like we were talking about, prefer protein because that's they need protein to nourish the brood and uh, lay eggs. They need protein for egg laying. That's the queen's job. So in the summer, She's gonna be more interested in sweets, uh, such as honeydew, and that's really what the colony is more interested in now. Uh, the fall continues with the honeydew producing insects that will die off naturally, so sweet feeders will need a replacement. And in the winter, a colony indoors is likely feeding off what they were eating, what they stored up. So we've all heard the story of the grasshopper and the ants, right? They, the ants store up all year round to make it through the winter. Uh, so inside the colony we were talking about, there's a caste system. There are workers, larvae, queens, and males. 
uh, colony propagation and dispersal. There's nest structure and communication. So the rest of it, I'm actually gonna switch over to termites at this point, because I think that there's more information that you guys would like to hear about that. So termites are, let me put this full screen. Um, why is this not going full screen again here? That's being, oh, I gotta move this up. All right, and then I can go back to it. And now I can go full screen. No, it's this. That should be okay. it. Here yeah, we are. Got it. All right, so now termites, as you all know, are wood destroying insects 100%. Uh, so despite the decline, it's still the largest market in pest control. Um, there's a lot more to pest control than what we've all talked about today. Uh, so termite control, the market was 1.15 billion in 2019. Uh, they caused an estimated $30 billion in damage in the US. And the average cost is around $3,000 to repair damage. So termites aren't good. Uh, they inhabit 70% of the world's land area. And if you look at this map down here, this is obviously America. The darker red, the higher the termite pressure, as we put it. Uh, the more soft, kind of whitish pink means that there's not so much termites there. Notice they love where it's really humid in the southeast and in California. Uh, in New Jersey, we fall into the moderate to heavy zone. So they're definitely here. We definitely deal with termites here. Uh, this, we were talking, I'm sorry, two minutes? Okay. Two minutes, yeah. So here we were talking before, you can actually see the difference now between an ant and a termite. A termite has a very thick waist, as we said, where ants have a narrow waist. Uh, that's really the easiest way to determine the difference of them. But on the right, this is a termite. On the left, those are ants. Uh, that's what we were talking about before. All right, so subterranean termites are what we have here in New Jersey. Now they inhabit soil, hence their name, subterranean termites, all right? Uh, they infest wood in the ground or in contact with the ground, and they utilize mud tubes to forage above the ground in search of food. Basically, they have to keep a very high humidity level or they dry out and they die. So you'll be seeing here that these are mud tubes. So they use mud tubes. These are hollow tubes that termites travel like ants do on the inside. They're hollow. That way they can keep their moisture content up really high as they are above the ground. Because if they were just in the regular air, subterranean termites, at least here in New Jersey, they will dry out and die quickly. So these mud tubes are what I'm sure you find in home inspections sometimes, but these are a telltale sign that a building has a termite problem. Uh, here's a little bit of their biology. Uh, they're highly evolved social insects. They're distinct ca uh, casts, just like ants. Uh, and they contain three casts, reproductives, workers, and soldiers. And they go from egg to nymph to adult. So here's what their eggs look like, uh, very similar to ants. They start off um, as eggs, the developing colony. Uh, the eggs are cared for by both the king and the queen. And by the end of the first year, a subterranean colony may range from 25 to 75 nymphs. Uh, that's what a nymph looks like. I know I'm running short on time, so I'll try to show you more photos here. This is what the workers look like. A lot of times they're mistaken as white ants, but no, those are termites. Uh, these are the workers. Once again, they're kind of clear and translucent, whitish. Uh, and then this is a swarmer here surrounded by workers. So a swarmer here, actually, this is what you see in the springtime when you experience a termite swarm right there. But oftentimes people can confuse them for ants. Uh, here is a queen. You can see with this big abdomen here, that's uh, what they used to lay their eggs. And then here's a good picture of some more mud tubes. So if you find this in a crawl space or a basement or on the outside of a building, uh, termites did that, and that means they're on the building and they're they're eating it. That's not good. So here's what a soldier looks like. They have these really big heads and they have these mandibles in the front. It's their job to guard their colony and fight every uh, off invaders. 
So that's why they're called soldiers. Uh, there's just another nice photo, some more soldiers. And swarmers, that's what we call primary reproductives. That's what we were talking about before. In the spring is the time where termites do grow wings and they swarm outwards as they're trying to expand their colony. They are quickly trying to get back into the ground because remember we talked about they need a high moisture level, uh, but they're gonna explode outwards, spread out and try to grow their colony. These are future queens, that's their job. Uh, another photo of them, kind of what we were just talking about here. Swarmers in the springtime are when you give us a call and let us know that you have a termite problem you need help with. Okay, we're just about right. up with time, but there are a okay. couple of questions. Did you want to wrap anything else up before? No, I... that's fine. I'll, okay. I'll certainly take your so, questions, yeah. Okay, Go so ahead. there's Sorry. a few. Um, the first question, are there any other wood warrant insects that eat wood furniture, interior, exterior, any other? Yes, wood? there are. There are carpenter ants, which I talked about a little bit. There are powder post beetles. Uh, there are carpenter bees, which we deal with all the time. So there are a number of wood destroying insects. Uh, the two main ones though are termites and carpenter ants. Uh, they do the okay. most damage, but there are other ones as well. Okay, and uh, what are the best solutions for controlling uh, termites and ants? All right, so there's really two ways that you can go. You can do a liquid application where you bond a termiticide around uh, the entire footprint of a building. So you're basically building a shield between what the termites want to eat, the wood of the building, and the soil that they live in. Uh, the other approach that you can do is you can put termite uh, bait stations around a building every 10 feet, and they're in the ground year round. And when the termite colonies find those and start feeding from them, they share it with the whole colony and it would die off. So there's more than one way to skin a cat or to kill termites, but those are the two approaches, either a liquid application or a termite baiting application. And depending on the building, we recommend both. It just depends on what we're dealing with. Okay, uh, those are all the questions. Um, that that brings an end to today's session. I know I enjoyed it. I hope everyone else in all the attendees enjoyed today. If anyone uh, watching had class, uh, further questions, feel free to uh, email the chapter and we'll forward them on to the speakers. But until next week, thank you all. I uh, hope to see you again all next week. Thank you, speakers. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Have Thanks a great everybody. day, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Yep. Stay safe and healthy. Okay.